Hello and welcome to this presentation on laser system applications in quantum technologies. My name is Ben Sutor. I'm an R&D engineer with Unique Lasers. So when we talk about quantum technologies, we usually separate it into three different groups. Our main interest lies in uh, quantum sensing. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that later, but just to introduce quantum computing is based on quantum entanglement first proposed by Paul Benioff in the 1980s. It is an efficient way to do high-speed, high-efficiency parallel computing with a lot of potential to outperform classical methods. And there's some potential for lasers in these applications for atom cooling or atom conditioning uh, for the atoms that are used in the computers. Now, quantum sensing is more important for us as a company um, these sensors are based on Doppler cooling and uh, atom trapping, which is basically a process of confining the atoms, keeping them very stable, in which case their frequencies can be uh, measured. So lasers are essential for these um, applications, from cooling to trapping, um, and then to inspecting these atoms. The third and the final group is quantum cryptography, which is a uh, very secure and relatively cheap uh, method of communication. One of the most popular protocols is the BB84, proposed by Bennett and Brassard. So this um, protocol uses um, characteristics such as the non-cloning theorem. Uh, so in, in this case, when um, Alice sends a message to Bob, uh, their, their information is reconciliated, so an eavesdropper is always uh, detected. And even for these technologies, lasers can be handy for um, single photon emitters, um, which can use, for example, two atom or two photon absorption, uh, which require very stable output wavelengths. So in this next slide, I'm showing a very broad top level diagram of a neutral uh, atom clock, um, which are the core of atom sensors or quantum sensors. Um, they have multiple stages as it can be seen and there are many different types of lasers or many different lasers used in these systems. So if we go from the left hand side you see that there's an atomic beam generated which needs to be quite consistent in its flow. It is then cooled down in multiple stages. First it's Doppler cooled to about a micro Kelvin temperature and it's then introduced into a Zeeman shifter and finally confined in an optical lattice. And in this optical lattice the atoms are inspected using the clock laser and this gives us a very good uh, frequency reference. Now, what type of uh, lasers do we need? Or what are the characteristics that are required? Um, for these applications. So we obviously need to be at the exact wavelength of the transition so for cooling atoms as well as uh, trapping atoms, the wavelength is very important, so we need to have a laser that can be tuned to that wavelength. Good power levels are important. Uh, intuitively, if we have a higher power, we can assume uh, that more atoms can be trapped. And as the diagram on the right hand side shows, a uh, narrow line which is essential. So if we assume that the, the transition uh, that we're interested in is the green area, then we try to make a laser that matches this uh, green area, so all the power is, uh, or the power overlaps with the transition line width. So obviously if our line width is broader, which is the case of this diagram, then some of the gray area might not be used by the system. When we talk about line width, there are different types of line widths that we can can define. So the instantaneous or um, short duration line width is uh, defined by the sh uh, shallow town's limit uh, which is shown in the center. So obviously our instantaneous line width is inversely proportional to the output power and it is proportional to the gain characteristics as well as the type of the laser. So for example because of some inherent intensity noise in semiconductor lasers for example we can assume that the DPS laser usually has uh, the lowest uh, instantaneous line width. When we talk more about um, longer uh, time intervals, such as a few hundred milliseconds, 
and obviously other factors such as external vibrations, temperature fluctuations or pressure changes can also affect the line width. Uh, and the third uh, type of line width or stability factor that we usually define for the lasers is the wavelength stability. That is the absolute stability of the wavelength over a longer period such as 8 hours or 24 hours. But these properties should all be taken into account when a laser uh, is introduced into a quantum sensor. But how do we get there? How do we trap the atoms? Um, now, there are multiple stages of cooling the atoms. Just as well as normal particles, we can use light to slow down an atom by interacting um, with its exact transitions. Once the atoms are cooled down, they can be confined. Uh, there is a, uh, an exact frequency called the magic wavelength that's used in optical lattice clocks. In this case, we can make sure that no external intensity uh, fluctuations would shift the, the frequency. So our frequency of the confined atoms is very stable and we can use the clock transition to inspect or measure the frequency of these atoms. Now the current um, time or frequency reference that we usually use is the cesium standard which is at 9.19 gigahertz since in the microwave range we use this standard to define the second. One example the strontium clock transition is 429 terahertz which is a, uh, the frequency of a forbidden transition from a singlet to a triplet state which is inherently very narrow line width. So using this much higher frequency we can assume a better accuracy. So as the Allen instability shows here on the bottom, uh, the instability is proportional to the, line, uh, to the line width. So the lower the line width, the lower the instability. Therefore, the better the stability is. And we also have n, which is the number of trapped atoms, and tau, which is the integration time. So if we inspect the atoms for longer, or if we have more atoms confined, then we can also achieve better stabilities. So it's one thing that we can confine these atoms, and we have these lasers to uh, inspect them, but how do we measure the optical frequency? Because one challenge is, if, if we think about the cesium standard, it is in the gigahertz range, uh, which means that uh, it can quite easily be measured using electronics, however, uh, there's no electronics that can measure the terahertz uh, frequency ranges. So the, <clears throat> the way we can do this is by using a very different type of laser, which is a pulse laser. So, so far we've talked about uh, very stable, narrow line with continuous wave lasers. Pulse lasers are a bit different. They are pulsed, so they have a short uh, duration but a very wide frequency spectrum. And so-called frequency comps can be created, which are act as an optical ruler. So they create discrete frequency lines uh, separated by a discrete repetition frequency. And we can use this ruler to uh, measure uh, the frequency or more to down convert the optical frequency to a more to an easily measurable microwave frequency. The way we can do that is if we lock our frequency comp to the optical frequency of the of the sensor, then we can then measure the repetition frequency, which is usually in the gigahertz range. We can measure the repetition frequency by using another resonator. And if we know the ratio between the optical frequency and the microwave frequency, then we can calculate the clock frequency. And this is a very neat way of, of, of uh, calculating high optical frequencies. So if we can all do this, what, what can, can we actually use this for? And one example which we have just completed recently is the Gravity Pioneer project led by RSK and the Birmingham Quantum Hub. Um, so this project was uh, or delivered a gravitometer using a quantum sensor. So as, as this example shows, there are new ways of, of measuring things with quantum sensors. The gravitometer lets researchers see underground, but we can also use quantum sensors to see underwater. So there are there there would be a lot of uh, new opportunities to 
to see beyond what we can see with current sensors. But if you think about better accuracies, it can be estimated that with the um, introduction of quantum sensors, we can increase time measurement accuracies by about a factor of 100, meaning that navigation systems such as GPS can also be a hundred times more accurate, so we could measure things down to millimeter precision instead of the current meter uh, precision scales. There's a lot of potential for a laser manufacturer, which keeps us going. So I hope you found this presentation interesting, and thank you very much.